a few years, this began to be a memory. And I, this was back in the 30s, and I can remember this. I was, uh, I, actually, I was at the both the groundbreaking and the opening of that line in 1949 and 1954, respectively. So uh, I go a long way back, too, too long, some say. This is at Young College. You can see uh, what's now College Park on the, on the left. And that crenellated castle-like building is still there at, on the north corner of the college. And this is at Granby, Granby Street. And those two-car trains were sometimes a continuous row of lumbering Peterwood cars crawling up the hill. I'll never forget it. And the um, trailers had no heating, no electric heating. There was a coal stove in the trailer. And the beauty of the third man on the team, the conductor of the trailer, there was no connection between the two cars for passengers, was to shovel a ladle full of coal in now and then on a day like we have today. And my relatives from New York City thought this was the quaintest thing they'd ever seen in their lives. <laughs> Fortunately, they were, all, they were all retired the day the subway opened. Uh, this was the subway construction with the uh, great wooden planking that uh, was used uh, for several years in the early 1950s. This is at, um, where the excavation began at King and Young, September 8th, 1949. Uh, if I forget everything else in my life, I'll never forget that day. And uh, this was the group of sidewalk superintendents, as they call them that line the excavation. That's the Eaton's old, the old Eaton's main store where Eaton Center is today <coughs> on the left. Though is Winter Garden, you can barely see the sign there. The famous Diana Sweets restaurant next door. And this was Lower Young Street. And this was a three and a half to four year messy, noisy process. And everybody was virtually, nobody complained, even though a lot of the old buildings were on Young Street suffered uh, considerable damage that was all taken care of. And finally, in late 1953, this was the, the heavy, beautiful red cars of, of, from the Gloucester Railway Carriage and Wagon Company in England, which were going to provide service on the, on the uh, young line, the original Red Rockets. And look how clean and pristine. This, this poor old station is now being pulled to pieces for long overdue expansion. Uh, one of the great things about the TDC, and the uh, chairman brought this up, is the incredible degree of convenience in integration between the surface and the subway level. And that's, that's, they feed each other. And the reason the subway is so heavily used here, by the way, the Young <coughs> subway is the most heavily used line, subway line in North America outside of New York City. And it's fed by so many other, so many service lines with free transfers, sometimes weather-protected, paperless transfers. That was a great innovation, and it still functions today. The sad thing is, this is near my office at St. Clair and Young, the St. Clair Station. You can see at that time there were no less than four different routes that fed into this station. There is just really the one now today, the much hated and in, in some circles beloved um, St. Clair LRT, or as I call it, uh, enhanced streetcar. It's not really an LRT, the stations are too close, and so on and so forth. We'll get into that. But it's a great improvement of what there was before, let me tell you, because I use it every day. Another great innovation was that the city uh, amended their zoning bylaws to actually create a link between land use density and diversity and transit capacity. And this, uh, 19, this is the 1973 view. This is not new. This is the 73 view of uh, the Young Street corridor from south of St. Clair to north of Eglinton. And you can actually see where the stations are. This unfortunately never happened on the Blue Danforth lines. And the only reason that line is so heavily used today is because it's fed by about 40 or 50 different surface lines. And that's the secret of success of Toronto's subway system in general, or most of it. Nine, early 1960s, uh, the 1966, towards a new plan for Toronto. 
We're great at doing plans, new plans. Boy, do we have plans. I mean, it, this is the reason I wrote the book. I started clearing out my office preparatory to retiring, which I haven't done yet. And the pile got up to the ceiling, and I said, somebody's got to write this up. If people knew how much uh, um, intellectual capital and money had been spent on planning, with very, very little to show for it, they would be a revolution. Well, Canadians don't revolt. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes it helps. But anyway, this was a plan which was one of the first ones that showed what, the, what we now know as the Spadina subway, except it wasn't Spadina. The original plan was to run that line south of, um, around St. Clair Avenue down Bathurst Street and not Spadina, and that would have been a much more sensible thing to do. You would have had three major subway lanes feeding into downtown instead of the two we now have, and that's one of the reasons it's so horribly overcrowded. And there, there was a bit of an impractical dream to extend this line right down to Gibraltar Point on the island. There was, there was supposed to be a uh, major uh, uh, urban development of uh, residential, Harbor City, where the Billy Bishop Airport is today. And uh, that was the reason for the extension. And then there was a little east-west line you can barely see there where um, it serves the exhibition place and connects back into Union Station. Still an idea that's being talked about in various and sundry forms from, from monorails to aerial uh, ropeways and God knows what, but the idea is no less a good one than it was then. And you can see the big circles are what creates a network. It's the interchanges, the redundancy, the choice of route, the ability to bypass breakdown. So we don't have that here. We do not have a network, we have a system. And there's a great difference, they're not synonymous. So, and then of course we see in all its glory the first incarnation since 1910 of the relief line, going from the roughly Danforth and Pate or Cuxwell down to Queen and along Queen all the way to um, um, Roncesvalles and, and, uh, and the Park Lawn Road, and not Park Lawn, the Park side. Uh, this was uh, the same year the Bloor Danforth subway opened, and for six months there was this remarkable integrated operation, which was a brilliant idea, never executed the way it should have been, but anyway, uh, there were three routes, the red, green, and blue, and you could reach the downtown from any one of the three extremities of the system at the time. Uh, every second train would head downtown, every second on, on Bloor Danforth, and the red line would be the straight through route on Bloor Danforth. There were some severe signaling problems and scheduling problems. There were great delays at the entrance to that great Y at uh, Avenue Road in Bloor. And to make a long story short, the TDC uh, won the day and separated the lines. And on that day, Bloorian and St. George became horror stories of overcrowding because they were never designed for massive, heavy interchanges of passengers. Uh, before this happened, those two stations really worked remarkably well. And of course, at that time, there was no Spadina subway. So the university line terminated at uh, St. George Station, it did not go further north. The idea was a great one. New York City has some incredibly complex interchanges of wires and so on, and interlining of various routes. Uh, we, for a variety of reasons, decided not to do that. 1969 was shortly after the inauguration of Go Transit in 1957. And the idea was deeply ingrained in the mind of a lot of the planners here to integrate the two systems. There was a question directed at the commissioner about that, um, the chairman about that. And here we have a idyllic system for the time that shows how the green go transit lines could be integrated with an expanded rapid transit system, an expanded subway system. And there's the Eglinton line, shown as a full-scale subway. There's a seminal study done by uh, Ed Levy, Richard presentation. Sobel, this is you may have heard of. video number two. Five, kicking and, and active. Uh, the Metropolitan Toronto Transportation Plan Review. 
which uh, was a 60 volume document. It's still one of the seminal documents ever produced in this city. And a lot of it is still uh, very relevant today. It boiled down to seven different networks. This is one of them, which shows the Angleton line as a major factor. The downtown loop, I always used to love calling this the levy loop because it was uh, so under the page, you know, it just sort of hung there in open space. And I've always loved it, and that's the way we should, we should develop the system, but never mind, it's, uh, it's slowly taking shape. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, consideration of the Fitch Hydro Corridor, as another light rapid transit uh, link. And the subway network, we knew it in the, in the thin red lines. And there were various other uh, alternatives here that showed um, different ways of developing the city, including creating a second downtown at Downsview Airport, interestingly enough, with a, with a whole new focal point up there. And that was the beginning of uh, what we now call downtown North York, the, the big black dot of the North End there. And then we began to go downhill from here, and politics took over. This was the first example in 1976. This was Metro Plan, where the city began to be planned inside out and upside down. Downtown was ignored. Downtown has got to go transit. What does it need more subways for? That sounds familiar. And here we have the uh, first um, priorities were the two little connections from the uh, uh, Blue Ridge Airport Subway, which now exists, going out to Kennedy in the east and over to uh, Kipling in the west, and they were to connect with um, light rail systems. One going to Scarborough City Center, which got built, and there was a similar plan to go to the airport in the Etobicoke section up the Hydro Corridor, which unfortunately never got built. But the Kipling station still has a dead platform for that future line. You can see it out of the windows from the mezzanine, and it was never, uh, never proceeded with. But the, the glaring problem with this map is there is nothing in the downtown area, nothing. And then, of course, the uh, Finch corridor at the top is, is on the plan as a third uh, priority. Uh, going further downhill, we had a major study done uh, in the Finch Shepherd corridor. Which, result, which was basically at the behest of, uh, Mayor, of Mayor Mal Lassman of North York at that time, and Mayor Campbell of Scarborough. And uh, the conclusion was we need a full-scale subway in the Shepherd Corridor with a connection on the Spadina line down from Downsview to Wilson, the north-south red line, and that's the only piece that ever got built until 2002, when a very short section of Shepherd was built from Young to Don Mills, and the rest of it's uh, never been proceeded with, and it's now the subject of great argument whether it should be an LRT, whether it should be at all, and therefore it wants a subway, and so on. You, you've all been assailed by the same uh, newsprint story that I have and everybody else has. And again, uh, no consideration for any improvements in the central area where the need is and always has been and always will be greatest. 